Right. Good, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I hope you're, you're all enjoying the, the conference. It's a, a great pleasure to, to be here with you all. Um, so I'm Dr. Jerry Carwhite. I'm the cardiovascular clinical director at Guy's and St. Thomas's, where I run our inherited cardiac disease unit. Um, and I'm going to spend probably about half an hour just going through uh, frequently used medications, uh, just with some key points some tips and questions that, that maybe you could think about asking when you're seeing your, your, your team. Um, and then we'll allow about probably about 15 minutes at the end of the talk just to go through all, all your different questions. So, let me just make a start. So we're just gonna go through drugs used in dilated and hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. A lot of people have sort of arrhythmias and coronary artery disease. So we, we'll touch on the commonly used drugs that, that we use in those fields as well. Okay, so if we start with, with dilated cardiomyopathy, um, I gave a talk on this this morning and I, I'm sorry, I don't know how many of you would have seen that and how many haven't. So the, the tiny bit of overlap, but, but I hope not too much. So if you take the cardiomyopathies, they're just a description of, of different things that happens to the heart muscle. So the muscle can then be thick, which is hypertrophic, or it can be larger than normal and weaker than normal, which is dilated. So the, the, that side of things is really just a description of, of what's going on. But what you need to do is then go down the, these next two lines, which, which a lot of people don't do. So if you have in particular dilated cardiomyopathy, you need to know if it's genetic or if there's another underlying cause. If it's genetic, should we look for the gene? If it's not genetic, can we find the underlying cause, particularly if there's a specific treatment? Um, so, so if you have dilated cardiomyopathy, try and find out from your medical team, is it genetic, is there another cause? If it's genetic, can we look for the gene? If it's not, are we happy? There's no underlying cause that we need to look for that, that might be treatable. Okay, so, so when we think about dilated cardiomyopathy, this is a heart that's bigger than it should be and it's weaker than it should be. And we, we define weakness normally by this thing called ejection fraction. So ejection fraction is percent of blood ejected in one beat. So normal isn't 100%, it's, it's 60%. And then when we're deciding what drugs to give people with dilated cardiomyopathy, we use two key things. We use this ejection fraction and we decide how, how symptomatic people are, particularly with regards to, to breathlessness, but also fatigue and exercise tolerance. And that's this New York Heart Association classification. And it's the combination of those two things that tell us what, what drugs to use. So for ejection fraction, the key cutoff is 40%. So if your ejection fraction is below 40%, there's two or three drugs that are very, very effective at getting your heart stronger and also help you live longer. And together they, they probably improve your, how long you live by about 50%. So really effective drugs. But the cutoff for that is this ejection fraction of 40%. Above 40%, you know, your heart is probably too strong and you probably don't need those drugs at that level. And I do think there's a lot of people whose heart is only very mildly weak who have started on these drugs that, that probably don't need them. So really important to know your ejection fraction. And then New York Heart Association classification, it goes from one to four. So class one is you have absolutely no symptoms. Class four is you're very limited with breathlessness at rest or really very, very minimal exertion. Um, class two and three is, so class two is limitation when you do quite a lot. Class three is limitation when you don't do very much. And often it's hard to decide whether people are in class two or class three. Okay, so if we look at management of of people with this ejection fraction of less than 40%. It's a busy slide, but it's quite an important slide. 
So the first thing you do is, is do people have fluid on board? So are they very breathless? Is the swelling of the ankles or tummy? If there is, that then we give these diuretic water tablets like furosemide or bumetanol. If you don't have fluid on board and you're not breathless, you do not need diuretics. And that's really important because they'll just give problems otherwise. Diuretics don't help the heart get stronger. They don't make you live longer. They're just to treat any fluid that's accumulated. We then come on down here to what we call prognostic medicine. So these are medicines that help you live longer and help your heart get stronger. And everyone with dilated cardiomyopathy and ejection fraction less than 40%, we would try and put on an ACE inhibitor and a beta blocker. The ACE inhibitor, the higher the dose, the better. We would try and get people on the top dose if we can. And the higher the dose, the, the better the improvement you get with that tablet. Beta blockers, we're looking to try and get a heart rate of around 55 if we can. So what we do is we give people those two drugs and then we wait a while. If, if their symptoms all go away, we don't do anything. If they remain symptomatic, we add this third class of drug called mineral corticoid antagonist. So that's spironolactone or aplerinone. They're prognostic as well. So they will help people live longer. They will help the heart get stronger. So they're the three key drug treatment for dilated cardiomyopathy. The three of those all help you live longer, all help your heart get stronger. It's just important just to go through the non-drug related things that, that we should be doing at the same time. Um, I think the more you understand your disease and the tablets you're on, the, the better. Um, if you're prone to accumulating fluid, wear yourself regularly. Um, a sensible diet, just in a general sense, but, but just normal amounts of salt. You don't need a very low salt diet. Everyone talks about fluid restriction. You only need to restrict fluid if you put on fluid and you're needing diuretics. If you're not on diuretics and you're not accumulating fluid, you, you don't need to restrict your fluid in any way. Um, just sensible alcohol, stop smoking. Um, I'll come on to, to the other bits in, in, in the next slides. Exercise, very important combination of aerobic core stuff and sort of resistance if you can. Immunizations, um, pneumococcal, flu, please have those and, and COVID if and when it comes out. Um, and I showed this on, on my talk this morning. So this is how effective these tablets are. So if you come into hospital with heart failure, and you have no treatment, your risk of dying is really high, up at 60% over a period of time. If you have all these treatments, it drops right down to here. So, so the effect of these two or three tablets together is, you know, is unlike, I think, anything else in medicine. It just transforms the, the outlook. So ACE inhibitors, beta blockers, mineral corticoid antagonists. So if you just spend a little bit of time talking through those three. So this is, this is the sort of underlying mechanisms really. So if you have heart failure, if you have heart failure with a dilated cardiomyopathy, that the heart is pumping out slightly less blood around the body. And the way evolution works is your, your body thinks it's bleeding because that's always what happened in the old days. So your body will activate all these hormones to try and retain salt and water. So it activates your sympathetic nervous system. That's your fight or flight response. And that's noradrenaline and adrenaline. And that gives you all these sort of bad things on your heart rate and on the heart muscle. And it activates this thing called the renin angiotensin aldosterone system. And that tries to retain salt and water, but also constricts the blood vessels and makes the muscle cells get scarred and get thicker. So when you have less blood going around the body, it's these hormones that actually cause the damage. And the drugs we give stop the effects of these hormones. So beta blockers, 
stop the effects of this increased activation of the sympathetic nervous system. ACE inhibitors, angiotensin receptor blockers and mineral corticoid antagonists, they help stop the harmful effects of this renin angiotensin system. There is a third pathway, a beneficial pathway, which is this naturetic peptide system, which does good things for the circulation of the heart. And Entresto, which is angiotensin receptor blocker, does all that here, but also enhances this third pathway. That's where that's a, a slightly different tablet. Okay, so if we just start with ACE inhibitors, um, and there's more, much more in numbers now, but you know, thousands of patients evaluated in trials, consistent improvement in, in how strong the heart is, symptoms, how well people feel, cuts the risk of dying by about 40, about 25% and cuts your risk of going into hospital. So very, very effective treatment. Um, and they're, they're called ramapril, perindropril, which would be some of the commonest. Enalapril is quite an old one, but, but still used. So what, what are the potential side effects? Allergic reactions are very rare, but you can get them with ACE inhibitors. So if you get swollen lips, eyes and face, it's very important to stop them, but, but that's very, very rare. When you have an ACE inhibitor, it's really important you start at a, a low dose and you slowly increase it up every two or three weeks in four or five steps. So you need to monitor the kidney and potassium, the blood tests as you do that. And when you have the ACE inhibitors, your, your creatinine, your potassium will go up a bit anyway. And that's not because it's damaging the heart, the um, kidneys, that's because the mechanism of how it works. So if it goes up by 30% your creatinine or your potassium goes up but is under five and a half, then it's fine just to keep going with them. But it does need monitoring. And once you're on a stable dose, probably every six months, you should get that checked. But so ACE inhibitors, because of the way they work, that they dilate some of your arteries and veins, so they tend to drop your blood pressure. On the whole, that's often a good thing. Um, but if you're getting dizzy, and if in particular you're getting dizzy when you stand up, then you may be on too high a dose. If you're getting dizzy standing up and you're on diuretic tablets, and you're not breathless and you haven't got lots of fluid on board, I would try and reduce those first. And that often solves the problem. The other thing to do is make sure you're not on any other tablets you don't need that might drop your blood pressure. So you may be on other blood pressure medicines, but you, know, you don't need those if you're on an ACE inhibitor and your blood pressure isn't high. But if despite all of that, you're dizzy standing up, then you may need to, to reduce the dose. The other common thing you can get with them is a cough. Um, now stick with it because that often goes away. If it doesn't, you can switch to what's called an angiotensin receptor blocker, um, which is pretty much as effective, but will get rid of the cough. Really important to check there's no other causes of cough though. So uh, and if you do have that, is you, you should try and have a chest X-ray and make sure someone listens to your lungs. So these are the angiotensin receptor blockers. They work like the ACE inhibitors. Um, but they work just slightly lower down the, the cascade. So here's ACE inhibitors stop this angiotensin going to angiotensin 2. Angiotensin receptor blockers just work one further step down the pathway. Very similar to ACE inhibitors, similar efficacy, similar side effects other than they don't give you the cough. So, so ACE inhibitors, there was a lot about ACE inhibitors and COVID. So this is where ACE inhibitors work. And there's one and two receptors. This is the ACE2 receptor here. This is where coronavirus binds to get into the cell. So there was different hypotheses that ACE inhibitors would either help with COVID or would make it worse depending on the mechanisms further down inside the cell. There's been a lot of trials come out now and, and ACE inhibitors and angiotensin receptor blockers are absolutely safe in COVID. I don't think there's any evidence they're protective there, but they're certainly safe 
And if you're on them, you should keep taking them. So, so, so beta blockers, um, very, very effective for anyone with dilatinomopathy and ejection fraction below 40%. Um, definite prognostic value, you, you will live longer on a beta blocker, you're less likely to come into hospital. It's worth making sure you have one of the ones that have an evidence base in cardiomyopathy. That's carbidolol, nabivolol, and bisoprolol, really. If you're on any of the others, it's worth thinking about switching. Um, if you have COPD, it's absolutely safe. Vascular disease, unless it's critical, you're safe. Um, even mild asthma, unless you have very brittle reversible asthma, most of the time is safe. So, so most people, the ejection fraction less than 40% should be on these beta blockers. Um, some people do struggle with beta blockers. Most people are fine with the ACE inhibitors. Beta blockers do give side effects. So if we look on the right side here, if you have asthma and you take them and you're more breathless, you should stop them. Um, they slow your heart rate and that's how they work. I think they definitely make some people feel tired. They have mild effects on glucose metabolism. They can give you sleep issues, nightmares, definitely give sexual dysfunction. And again, like the ACE inhibitors, you can get a, a low blood pressure, when you, particularly when you stand up. But the really important thing with beta blockers is it takes about eight, 12 weeks to really adapt to them. And they're such an important drug in terms of outlook that, that often you have to put up with these side effects, but it does get better for most people. So after eight, 12 weeks, often most of the side effects will go. And actually a lot of people feel even better than they did before at that stage. So when you, if you've been given beta blockers and you gave up after a week and it wasn't awful side effects, have another go because it takes eight or 12 weeks to really adapt. And it takes that time to really adapt as you're increasing up the dose as well. So please do, do try and persevere. But the other thing is, if you're struggling with beta blockers, try a different one. And the bivalol in particular tends to have quite a good side effect profile. So if you didn't tolerate the soprolol, maybe chat to your, your medical team and see if you can have a go with nabivalol. So if you can, really try and persevere with the beta blockers. But, but if you can't tolerate them and, and there is a, a small percentage that can't, then, then you know, that, that's okay. You shouldn't have a, a poor quality of life. So mineral corticoid antagonists, again, work in that similar pathway to the ACE inhibitors, but again, a little bit further down. So if on the ACE and beta blockers, you're still having symptoms, you should have them. If you have a heart attack and have symptoms after, you should have them as well. So there's only two of these, and that's a plerolone and spironolactone. Um, plerolone, the trials would say you give for mild symptoms spironolactone perhaps for, for the more severe symptoms. And what are the side effects? So when you add these on to your ACE inhibitors, sort of kidney and potassium problems become a bit more frequent. So you do need careful monitoring, the blood test to look at that. And there's clear guidance as to when you reduce or when you stop it. I think you do see more GI symptoms than people realize with these. So if you're on these, and you're having gastrointestinal symptoms, ask your medical team whether they could be a cause. So for spironolactone, painful breast swelling, so gynecomastia, it is a relatively common side effect. If you are getting that on spironolactone, switch to a pleronone and that will get rid of it. But so if you do have that, do, do switch from spironolactone to a pleronone. Okay, so, so diuretics, again, just, just to be really clear, you only need diuretics if you're breathless, if you've got edema in your legs, if you've got a side swelling in your tummy. Um, otherwise, you don't need diuretics, and they'll just make your kidney function worse, make you go to the loo all the time. Often people need diuretics when they're first diagnosed, they're often more poorly at that stage. Then you get on all these other tablets, you get better, the heart gets stronger, 
but you're left on the diuretics. So if you're well, you haven't got fluid on board, you're not breathless, you know, every time you see your medical team say, look, if you're on diuretics, can I stop them? Can I try reducing them? Um, that, and it's very straightforward. If you reduce them and feel worse, you can go back up on them. But, but when you're well, just if you're on diuretics, try and get off them. But there's then the other extreme. So people who are struggling with breathlessness and fluid overload and can't get the, the edema off. And then there's different kinds of diuretics you, you put together to, to try and do this. So if you're struggling to get the fluid off, a combination of diuretics is better than just a big dose of one. So most people start with what's called these loop diuretics, and that's fruzamide or bumetanide. Start one or two a day, but you can go up to four or six a day if you have to. Once you're on more than two or three a day, you need to think about adding the other diuretics. If you're not on spironolactone or plerinone for the, the low ejection fraction, you would then add that in then. And then you can add thiazide diuretics such as benzoflumethazide. Or there's a strong one called metolazone that's really effective if you're struggling with, with fluid problems. So, so the best way if you're struggling with fluid is a combination of those three diuretics together. The other thing you should do is split your diuretic dose. So don't take three at one point in the morning. You want to take perhaps two in the morning at one at lunchtime. Or, so split your doses often gives you a, a better response. Okay, so if you're still symptomatic, what, what else can we do in terms of trying to help the symptoms? Um, if you're symptomatic and have a high heart rate, despite maximal dose beta blocker, or you can't tolerate a beta blocker, we would think about a drug called abradine that just slows the heart. And then digoxin and intresto are the other two we think about. So Intresto is an angiotensin receptor blocker, but it also has another part to it that enhances that naturetic side that I showed in the previous slide. And for people that are symptomatic despite ACE and beta blocker, it probably has the same effect as the ACE inhibitor for double it. So it's, so it's a very effective tablet but it's only for those that are symptomatic having been on full dose ACE and beta blocker. Um, so if you have dose catamotin, your check fraction is less than 40%, you're still symptomatic on a good dose of Ramapril and your blood pressure isn't below 100, then ask your medical team if you can switch to Entresto. Um, tends to drop your blood pressure a little bit more, so, so watch out for that if you're switching and sometimes it gives you a diuretic effect so often people can reduce or even stop their diuretics on it. Hydralazine and nitrates so this is a combination that works a little bit like an ACE inhibitor um, but doesn't have kidney effects so if you have sort of renal problems if your creatinine say above 250 or 300 we would often give this combination instead of ACE inhibitors. If you're Afro-Caribbean, there's some evidence that it gives you probably increased benefit. And sometimes, particularly if the blood pressure is high in Afro-Caribbeans, we would add that on top of the ACE inhibitor. OK, there's these new class of tablets that, that there's quite a lot about over the last two or three years. So there's these glucose transporter inhibitors that are initially set up as as diabetic tablets for people with type 2 diabetes. But they found in the diabetic trials that it seemed to help with cardiovascular events. And now there's been trials in patients with heart failure to show it's very effective. Um, so it reduces the risk of, of heart failure or cardiovascular death. And in the meta-analysis, maybe even all-cause death. So they are good for people with dilated cardiomyopathy, again, who have a reduced ejection fraction at less than 35 or 40 percent. Um, there's some questions on this, so I'll, I'll go into this a little bit more detail at the end. Um, but they're effective for 
for people with reduced, reduced ejection fraction, whether they're diabetic or not. Um, so you don't have to be diabetic to benefit from those. Okay, so hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. If we're thinking about the, at the moment, there's, there's not really any tablets that affect long-term outcome in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, and um, defibrillators do, but there's no proven tablets, but there are ones coming through. Um, so you, most of the time we're using tablets to treat symptoms. And the key thing there is whether you have obstruction with the hypertrophic cardiomyopathy or you don't have obstruction. Um, and in terms of obstruction, of a third will have it at rest and another third when they exercise. And this is what I mean when I say obstruction. So this is the thickened septum that you get in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And you can see it again down here. So this wall is much thicker than this wall down here, isn't it? So that's the septal hypertrophy. I just pause that one. And here, this is the mitral valve. And this has got sucked in here towards this thickened septum. So this then, your blood's coming out over here and it can't get out because of this pulling of this mitral leaflet towards the thickened heart muscle. So that makes it like having a narrow valve in the heart. So that's what the obstruction is. See that? And you can see it here as well, this valve getting sucked towards this thickened septum. And it just, that's the blood flowing in and out. It just makes it very hard. So if you have symptoms, the, the first thing we would do is decide, do you have this outflow tract obstruction or not? If you don't, these are some of the tablets we use. We've mentioned beta blockers. Calcium antagonists work a little bit like beta blockers in hokum. Um, diuretics, we would sometimes try low dose. So that's for the breathlessness. For the chest pain, it's parapamil beta blockers. We definitely don't have obstruction. Sometimes we try these nitrate tablets. They, they dilate the, the arteries, including the coronary arteries, and we do use these for angina as well. Often give headaches, but the headaches tend to settle. So again, take some paracetamol and try and stick with it for, for a few days. Okay. So if you have obstructive cardiomyopathy, First thing is to stop vasodilating drugs, stop the amlodipine and things like that that you're on. And then it's beta blockers, calcium antagonists, particularly verapamil and diltiazem. If you don't have coronary artery disease, we can add in a tablet called diazepiramide. Often gives you dry mouth, blurred vision, nausea at the higher doses. So we would start at a low dose and gradually increase that up. Calcium antagonists work very well. What are the side effects of them? You can get headache, abdominal problems, certainly get swelling of your ankles and need to keep an eye on your blood pressure high. If you have obstruction, hokum, and you're very symptomatic despite trying all these drugs and the other options like the septal ablation or, or surgery, there are other options. So if you're symptomatic with obstructive hokum, we can nearly always improve that as we go down that sort of list of things we can do. And new things coming through. So there is Mavacampton, which is this myosin inhibitor um, that has had a, quite a large trial that certainly showed some promise in, in obstructive hokum. So functional class, that NWHA functional class and the health status got better with that. So we're starting to work out how we integrate that in, into clinical care. I just want to say a, a bit about statins. So, so a lot of people with cardiomyopathy will be on statins. So there's a, a lot in the press all the time about statins. Statins have transformed the, the outcome of, of cardiac patients with vascular disease. They're an incredibly effective treatment in the right group. And um, this is probably the best trial. It's still old, but it's pooling data on just under 100,000 patients. And this is people who've had a previous heart attack or other vascular event, people without it. So this is primary prevention. 
this is secondary prevention. This is control. This is statins. So in every single aspect, it reduces it by about 15, 20, 30 percent per millimole of, of LDL cholesterol, you reduce it by. But the benefits clearly higher in those with previous events because their risk of having more events is higher. Um, so, so if you've had a heart attack, if you've got proven vascular disease on a CT coronary angiogram or a doctor of your carotids, statins are fantastic. They stop the atheroma getting worse. They, they won't make it get better. They stop it getting worse and they stabilize the plaques. So the heart attacks and strokes are the acute events where a, a plaque gets rough and you form a clot on it. What statins do is they stabilize the plaque so it's less likely to rupture. And they also have some antioxidant effects. So if you have proven vascular disease, they, they transform things. The primary prevention side, you just need to pick a level at which you should have it. So you can calculate your your risk over 10 years. And if it's over 10, 15%, then it's definitely worth, worth thinking about them. But the benefit's slightly less for the primary prevention. Muscle aches, um, quite a common side effects with statins. You can switch the statin. Most of the time you can find one people tolerate, but there's a lot of genetics in the response to statin. But even if you take your statin just twice a week, you're getting probably 60, 70% of the benefits from it. So even if you're on a small dose two or three times a week, it's, it's much better to do that than not have it at all. If you can't tolerate statins, there's some new injections now that work pretty much as well, if not even better than statins. So if you have a definite need for them and you can't tolerate it, I'll ask your GP to be referred. It would have to be to a specialist lipid clinic now but there are these new injections that work incredibly well. Um, aspirin, so a lot of people are on aspirin. Um, I think a lot of people are on aspirin that, that maybe don't need to be. Um, we used to give aspirin in atrial fibrillation, but, but now that we've seen there's no benefit for that. So if you're on it for atrial fibrillation, you shouldn't be. You should either be on nothing or, or proper anticoagulation. Um, if you've had a, a vascular event, if you've had a stroke or a heart attack, you definitely need to be on it. It makes the platelets less sticky, makes you less likely to have more events. Um, in terms of primary prevention, so if you have a high cholesterol, high blood pressure, but no events, then it's a very much a gray area. And the data there now would seem to say in that group, it cuts your risk of non-fatal heart attacks, but puts up your risk of bleeding, particularly from the stomach. So it's a gray area and very much sort of discussion and, and shared decision making. Um, digoxin, um, useful in atrial fibrillation. And if you have sort of bad problems with your cardiomyopathy, we, we often add it in and it can give you symptomatic benefit. And um, there's some data in this year's. And the SC to suggest actually it's probably more helpful in atrial fibrillation than we previously realized, particularly in the, the more elderly people. Um, amiodarone is, is an antiarrhythmic drug. It's very effective for, for fast heart rhythms. Of all the drugs, the most effective, but, but a, quite a toxic drug. So up to 40% will have side effects. Um, eye, liver, kidney thyroid, lung. So you need a good reason to be on amiodarone. Some people have it for atrial fibrillation that comes in and out, and then they end up staying in atrial fibrillation. You know, if that's the case, you should stop the amiodarone. So if you are on this, um, it's a very effective drug, but just make sure with your medical team, it's the right drug and you still need to be on it. Um, if you have atrial fibrillation, these new oral anticoagulants are, are better than warfarin. Um, doesn't really matter which one you're on, but they're definitely easier to take. You don't need a blood test and, and they're safer than warfarin. Um, you can't have these for, for heart valves and you can't have these for, for blood clots in the heart. 
that you have left ventricular clots. Um, always worth thinking about the drugs to avoid if you have a weak heart. Um, Rafamil, doxazacin, the diabetic litazones, try not to have too many non-steroidals like neurofen. Um, and then can we stop medicines? So, so we do lots of trials about starting them, but very few about stopping them. But there is one that's come out recently. So if you have a dilated cardiomyopathy and you have a good response and your heart gets stronger and your symptoms go away, if you then stop the drugs, quite often things get worse. So unfortunately, it looks like if you've had the drugs responded really well, you probably do need to, to stay on them. Um, erectile dysfunction is really common in people that take these drugs. Um, and often I think people don't, don't mention it, but, but really do because you can switch the, often you'd switch the Ramapril to Candesata and you'd switch the Vesoctol to Nabivalol. Um, and it's, you know, in nearly everyone, it, it's pretty safe to take Viagra and drugs like that. So please do, do mention it because it's very, very treatable. Um, mental health issues, you know, hugely under-recognized and under-treated. It's hard to access services, particularly at the moment. If you have a cardiomyopathy, you know, please bring up anxiety and depression, um, which is common. Um, there's a lot of virtual psychological services now, which are very helpful. And I just want to say, so antidepressants are, are safe in nearly everyone. Occasionally, you need to keep an eye on your QT interval with an ECG and be a bit careful if you're on diazepiramide, but, but in nearly everyone, they're safe to take if you need them. Um, last few slides. So polypharmacy. If you look at this, this is just looking at number of medical conditions you have and number of drugs you're on. A lot of people are on a huge amount of drugs. The more drugs you're on, the, the poorer your quality of life. And it's the most useful resource here are the pharmacists. So if you can have a medicine review with your pharmacist, you know, maybe there's two or three tablets you really don't need. A um, little bit about compliance. That studies would suggest that a lot of people don't take their tablets either because they don't want to or they forget or for a variety of reasons. So do, you know, particularly those ones that affect how the heart rate models, you know, if you're struggling with compliance, again, the pharmacists are a fantastic resource. And then what, what to do as a patient. So, you know, have an up-to-date list of medicines, ideally on your phone. We, we need to know what you're on, what the doses are, and how often you take them. Um, have a copy of your latest clinic letter again, if you can, on a phone. Um, local pharmacists are a fantastic resource, so please do them. And every time you, you go and see your, your team, just question the medicines you're on. Am I on the right ones? Do I have the right dose? Can I stop my diuretics? Are there any other medicines I can stop? Is there anything new coming through? Um, so, so please do, every time you're seeing, do, do go through your medicines. But we need to know what you're on before we have that discussion. So make absolutely sure you, you've got an up-to-date list. Um, okay, so, so I think that's the end of the presentation. It's gone a little bit longer than I thought, but we've still got 10 minutes or so to, to go through your questions. So I will try and move some of my windows around to go up and go through your questions. Um, so can my beta blocker restrict my ability to exercise? Um, yes, it definitely can. Um, your heart rate won't go up as high uh, and you probably won't be able to do quite as much exercise on a beta blocker. Again, give it two or three months to adapt. If you're really struggling, talk to your medical team, it may be you can reduce the dose slightly, it may be you can try a, a different beta blocker. Um, you know, they, they are very effective for helping your outcome, but they definitely can affect your, you know, your energy levels, your ability to exercise. Um, switching it, sometimes reducing the dose um, can be useful. We can put you on treadmills to actually see what your electrics do when you exercise again is sometimes useful and the timings of taking a medicine 
Um, but the timings are important if you're struggling and there's a lot of genetics in how people react to tablets. Often splitting medicines helps if you're struggling a little bit. So you can split the ramipril and the bisoprolol, the spironolactone will, will be only once a day. Um, and you can, to, to be honest, you can just try and see what works best for you. Some people, if they take it at night, it works best. Some people find taking it in the morning works best. There's not a right or wrong, um, but it's definitely worth, if you're finding exercise tricky, just, just play with the timings to find out what works best for you. Okay, um, dapagliflozin. So, so yes, yeah, so it, it's dapagliflozin definitely has an evidence base. Definitely is effective in people with with heart failure with an ejection fraction that's reduced, so below 40, 35 percent. Pretty much everyone with that who doesn't have poor kidneys will be suitable. Um, it has to go through through nice before we start prescribing it. Um, if you're diabetic, you can probably get it through the diabetic side, but it'll have to go through NICE for heart failure. Um, and that's been postponed a little bit by COVID. Um, but I think that'll be out and mainstreaming maybe early next year. Um, Mavacantum. Mavacantum not available on the NHS. And again, I think one small trial, um, there's other trials on similar classes of drugs coming through. So it's a very exciting area. Again, we would have to go through NICE. I reckon time scale is, is probably a year or more for that. Um, dilated carbopathy, taking ramipril, um, lung cancer. I, I don't think that's that's a real thing. There's, there was a little bit with candesartan as well a while ago that got disproved with some meta-analysis. So I, I don't think there's a, a particular risk of cancer with, with ramipril. Um, so myocardia and cytokinetics. Um, yes, so again, there's um, myosin activators for, for DCM. There's, uh, and then there's the Hocum drugs that these companies are involved in. They are promising and there's, you know, I think there's good evidence for both of them. I think they're both quite exciting. We're, we're talking maybe a year or so, maybe longer, maybe two years before they're, they're out. And there are more trials coming through on those. Alternative ACE inhibitor for ramipril, yeah, absolutely. There's seven or eight different ACE inhibitors. If you're struggling, try them. Um, if you can't take an ACE, angiotensin receptor blockers um, are, are pretty much just as effective, so worth, worth trying them. If you can't take either of those groups, then, then hydralazine and nitrates are a good option. Okay, um, and I think that's the, the last question I can see. Yeah, so, so thank you very much to everyone for your time. Um, that, you know, medicines are really important. And I think, you know, that the more involved you are as a patient, the, the better you'll do, the better the outcomes, the better your quality of life. But to know the medicines you're on, understand why you're taking them. You know, use the fantastic resource that the Coma for UK can help with. Um, always have your list and always you know, question, are things changing? Can you reduce some? Is there anything new coming out? So always, you know, every time you have a, an appointment with your pharmacist, the nurse, the doctor, always make a point of, of going through your medicines and seeing if there's any changes that, that need to be made. And, and quality of life is, is incredibly important. You know, don't try not to put up with medicines that make you feel awful every day. You know, there's a lot we can do. There's lots of different medicines within the same class. So, you know, we, we want you to have the best outcomes, but we want you to have the best outcomes with the best quality of life. And medicines are an incredibly important part of that. So, you know, always have those discussions and don't be frightened to, to ask all those questions. You know, that's what we're there for. We're there to to support you and adjust your medicines as, as best we can together. So always try and bring it up at your appointments. Um.